They say it's always the good ones that go first, but when someone you knew dies unexpectedly, the idea of accepting they will no longer be there, the pain of letting go is like no other. I had lost loved ones before, but on this day, it felt different. My cousin Sami was gone, gone so suddenly, yet so painfully, he had taken his own life. People were talking. They knew how Sami had died, but how they said it, how they perceived it is what worried me the most. This was the second funeral I was attending in a span of just two weeks where suicide was the cause of death. In both cases, what had happened was no secret, but nobody was willing to talk about or try to understand why these two young men had taken their own lives. The question why bothered me too. I may have laid my cousin and friend to rest, but I had no closure. So I decided to search for answers and speak to people who have been to the edge, as well as those who are conquering their fights with mental illness every day. I'm hoping at the end of this, I will understand why my cousin died and speak to others about mental health, a subject largely dealt using two words, stigma and silence. From what I've heard people talking, people don't take it very lightly. They don't take it kindly. So if you tell people, you'll be tagged like Wenda Wazimu, Yule Wenda Wazimu. Globally, suicide is the second leading cause of death among youth aged between 15 to 29 years. Close to 800,000 deaths every year are suicides. That's one person every 40 seconds. In Kenya, between 2008 and 2017, the number of recorded suicides rose by 58% to reach 421. Three quarters of all those deaths were of men. This year, two of those who will be counted as having taken their own lives are my cousin Sami and my friend. I can't name him here because his family is still processing his death. If I thought it was hard to deal with Sami's suicide, it must be a lot worse for his sister Helen. I knew I will share a testimony one day, but whichever way because I was given a chance to pay tribute to him, and it was something that was dear to my heart. That's when I thought I should say it as it was, at least for them to know that he, he's died of an illness like any other, like malaria, like cancer. Tom was just unwell. He was not rebellious. He had not cancer. us. He fought to remain cool, calm, and collected. People put a lot of stigma. They look like... Hers was a heartfelt tribute, but it was also a very brave thing to do in front of a crowd that hardly ever spoke of suicide and a church that outrightly rejects the concept. Uh, where I come from, there's still a lot of stigma and there's a lot that needs to be done because we felt um, stigmatized even by the church. Especially when they knew uh, my brother had committed suicide. So a day, I think a day or two before he was buried, they just came home and um, told dad, told my parents that, uh, you know your son committed suicide, so we can't bury him. Sami's funeral was held outside because the church cannot oversee the burial of people who committed suicide. You see, for me, a church is supposed to be, you're supposed to reach out to the living. You're just having, you're just having a, a service to comfort maybe the family and to reach out to the, those who are living because he's gone. You don't go digging out someone's supposed uh, files to look for why did he commit suicide, he's rebellious and stuff like that. So I think they should just get out of that cocoon of um, they, are, they are judging someone because he's committed suicide and it's like he's committed a bigger sin than someone else. Helen is talking about judgment of the dead by the living. 
but that stigma around mental illnesses is very much alive. A lot of this comes from not knowing what mental illness is. There is stigma out there, uh, but really it is, uh, we should not have stigma because as we have said, a psychiatric condition is a medical condition like any other. Uh, uh, and one does not bring it on themselves. In most situations, uh, someone will only, and especially the family, will come out to seek help when the situation is completely out of hand because people will look at it as madness. Oh, this person has gone mad. So you don't want to be referred as mad because it's a sense of you've lost control. You're not in your own senses. While it could just be a situation that requires medication, regulation, a social support, some skills to survive challenges, and life goes on in a normal way. People don't really understand it. Uh, I think just the same way I was before I, I, my daughter was diagnosed with uh, bipolar. That was nine years ago. Christine Bide and her daughter Tiffany have walked a long way since finding out that Tiffany has bipolar and ADHD two of the most well-known kinds of mental illnesses. So I used to like try and convince myself that put makeup, you'll be fine. Along the way, they have seen for themselves the impact of stigma around mental illnesses. One time when I took my daughter to the hospital to see her doctor, psychiatrist, I met this lady. She'd just been told as well that, you know, the doctor, the, the daughter needs to go see a doctor. Then as I left her so that I go do some stuff and come back, the lady ran to me at the, uh, at the lift. And then she was like, does this mean my daughter is mad? I didn't even know her. You know, so I was like, why? Since I was told to bring her to a psychiatrist. Why do people come to a psychiatrist? Because their daughter's children are mad. When my daughter cleared her class eight, she didn't do very well. So um, I, I looked for a school for her and I had to find a school for her. I took her to one school. She stayed there for one, one term and she couldn't hack it at all. Then I moved her to another school. The first year was okay. Second year, the teacher kept telling me, you know, I think you need to take your daughter for counseling. So me, I'm like, you know, I'm doing my career. I'm thinking, you know, what's going on? I mean, no, no, no. I think, I mean, I'm bright. I went to school. I, I, I did well. I'm, I'm, and my daughter is really bright. You know, she's street smart. She's brilliant in everything that she does. So I didn't think it was such a big issue. So I'd be like, no, no, she just needs to work hard in her academic. I came to realize something was off when, when being sad was normal. Like, I would have to try so much harder than the other kids to just be happy and cope. Like, I used to have a problem with everything. I don't know why, like I just create something like something would be off and then it would, I would just spiral like all of us, I'm just down for no reason. Like it could be something so small, like someone says, why do you look like this? Or like, um, why do you have a, where's your dad? It could be something so minuscule that someone else can answer like in a proper way. But for me, it would be like, why is it because of me? Did I do this wrong? Yeah, it, w it was those kind of small things that made me realize the way my friend can answer a question is not the same way that I'll answer that question. I will immediately think that I am the one who, who has the fault. And then I'll be like, I think it was from that time when I was five years old. And <laughs> yeah. So I kind of started noticing that I have something different um that time and then also with the way i used to react to things like i used to do just basic extremities if i'm not happy i'm sad i don't have a middle atty mother and daughter were at odds with one another they were growing apart at some point but one day something traumatic happened to tiffany that forced them back together when i want to know you from school one time I was attacked by someone. They cut me up and like they were trying to basically rape me. They held me down, so I'm not gonna go into so much detail about that. But after that, 
I kind of started being so reclusive like I was just keeping to myself for a lot. Luckily some other guys were walking near there and they he ran away. So what happened is she walked to my office when the uh, office she went straight to the toilet and sat down on the floor. So the guard calls me and says there's something wrong with your daughter. So um that's when I realized what was wrong. So I first reported to the police and went to Nairobi Women's. Uh now the funny part about it is when when I I met in the toilet she she was crying she was on the floor and crying. When we got to the hospital she was you know okay you know I don't know how to put it manic let me put it that way she was excited and stuff and me I was dying inside I was so mad I was crying my friend came there I was crying and her she's like you know what's the big deal so I'm calling my mom I'm saying my mom uh you know uh Tiffany was almost raped and her she's like ah oh, mom can I get something to eat so I wondered that reaction was not normal the following day i thought no let me take her for a review yeah uh um so we went to naro uh, karen hospital yeah uh, she was hospitalized for trauma i think that's when it really hit her i became angry and my anger would make me do drastic things i would get suicidal i would cut myself i would i just do extra things like <laughs> I always felt like it's my fault if I didn't do this, if I didn't decide that day not to wait for or I mean get late for the bus then this wouldn't have happened, you know. She'd cut herself on her hands, you know, and she'd hide it. She'd wear her, her sweater up to the top. So I wouldn't get to know. And when I asked her eventually when we actually now got to realize she has a condition, she said um she wanted to feel alive. She couldn't feel herself. And yes the days when you look and you you can see there is that she's out of her own body I don't know how to put it she's just going with emotions she's not there but she's there that still happens up to now like you know yeah you can see you're talking to her but you're you're talking to a person who's not um her mind is not there at all yeah okay do you remember did you ever see this one just now I was thinking maybe I spent too much time running away from my shadow to let the sun catch my face. Yeah, see that. That's a good one. Just now I was thinking maybe I spent too much time running away from my shadow to let the sun catch my face. You always say the spotlight doesn't shine for ghosts. I'd say thanks for nothing but nothing doesn't carve its brush strokes into my skin like your fingernails do. Now, Christine and Tiffany have a much stronger relationship. Tiffany can share what's going on with her and her mom gets it. They are also open about Tiffany's condition with friends and relatives. I'm not quite what you make me out to be. I laugh so I won't cry. Yet that doesn't save me when I'm alone. I try to save the world simply because I can't save myself. But not all stories have the benefit of sunlight. Many people still hide in the shadows because of their mental illness. Why why did you choose to share your story anonymously? I met June and George, not their real names. Both are highly respected professionals publicly, but even their credentials would mean nothing in the face of a public admission about June's condition. From what I've heard people talking, people don't take it very lightly. They don't take it kindly. So if you tell people you'll be tagged like when there was Zimu, William when there was Zimu. It's not something good and I would not want my children to know about it. I would want them to live a normal life without stigmatization. June has affective disorder, a mood disorder that makes her vulnerable to fits of intense violence. I was a very normal person, but I had moments of anger which you wouldn't notice. Maybe it is because my childhood was in smooth. My dad was not there for us. It was only my mom who was taking care of us. I finished my high school like a normal person. I went to college as a normal person. Later on, in my second employment, that is when I got a trigger. You know, in phases of life, there are challenges that can't be under control. So, I felt stressed and depressed. I would have even hallucinations. 
you feel like you are a superhero, you can do anything you want, you feel carefree. For her, she never remembers. That is the funny thing about it. Uh, she can even stab you, but she'll never remember. She'll come to say sorry later, but when she is in that state, uh, she remembers nothing. When I come back to myself and ask what happened, it tells me this and this happened. It really hurts me because it is not my intention. It is not what I would have intended to do. I regret a lot and I feel like I should have controlled it, which is not in my hands. And my doctor told me I cannot control it. What I can do is to avoid it coming, but once it comes, it is something you don't have control over. June is seeking treatment and it has been two years since she has had an episode. But the weight of her secret is what both of them struggle with every day. That's something that Onyango Otieno understands only too well. I've gone through depression and uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. And uh, it's a thing I'm still uh, dealing with in my life. I remember coming back home uh, January 18th and taking a shower for two hours, asking myself, what am I gonna do? after I'm done here because I don't want, I don't feel like living anymore. Um, my friends who are dead do not have to be worried about traffic, <laughs> about their next meal, about rent. Why can't I just join them? You know, you get those thoughts. So I sat and I opened up my laptop. I uh, got onto Facebook and I started writing. It was one of the most difficult things I've ever had to write. I told people I'm not okay, that I'm depressed, that um, I need help, that um, I'm all these things you people see, but today, things are not fine. Look at emotions as something that you're cooking. So if you have something you're cooking that needs to release the pressure and you keep on pushing back the pressure, there's no lid to open, and you don't reduce the fire, it will end up burning. So that will be someone who, whether it's man or woman, who does not have an environment where they can express and release their emotions. Onyango chose to open that lid of emotions. My cousin Sami, like many men sometimes do, chose to deal with his problems on his own. He was a vibrant person, he loved his job, he loved socializing. He loved, basically he loved being with people. And when he began alienating himself to people, he stopped going to work at times, sleeping too much, and um, at times even having, talking like he's doing a will in the midst of your conversation or talking of, he, he's not having a future in his conversation. That's when you know that this person is, is unwell, he's depressed and he needs help. And at times you could gather from his conversation that I need help but I don't know how to express it. Because I don't Tiffany relates to what Sami went through in the lead up to his last days. She too was also on the edge. I've never lacked support. With all of that I'm like I'm not I'm not good enough for you guys, you know, like... I'm not good enough, so, like... If, let me tell you, if the equation doesn't add up, the first thing you should subtract is yourself. So I just, I didn't want to like hurt anybody anymore and, and make, especially my mom, feel like I know there's, there's better ways I would have gone about it. I would have tried to be a better person, but it felt like it was really tiring. I, I didn't get good grades in school. I had everything to give me good grades. I had a mom that 
literally got me anything that I asked for. She came to my school. Whenever they asked, she would get me. She she built me up, but I wasn't building up. I I couldn't understand why. So yeah, I tried to just remove myself. Inani bidi mini nyamaze nikija ni bujuchi ni boranji kaze. Staki ni jeni wa shangaze mtari buju na langu muli sambaze. This piece is basically about depression, the extreme degree of depression, in the sense that uh, the person in question uh, now considers suicide as the last last option. On the red corner. On the blue corner, ni zangu bado. Zina exchange blows. Quick and fast. My mind is your ring. In a self, the audience. But tayari you can delay But fight in and delay. Thoughts versus thoughts. Punch against punch. Soon that one knocked out. Like he's strong to angu. Strong to angu. Strong to angu. This one is through a personal experience because we had. One of us, he was going through something terrible in his life, but it was difficult to know because he just acted normal. Yeah, we just used to meet, we talked, we laughed. Yeah, yeah. And then all of a sudden, he committed suicide and it, and it really hurt us. So we decided to write something so that we can tell people that these things happen. Yeah. Because people think that when you, when you smile, you are okay. They don't know what you're hiding. As much as... Um you hear people commit suicide out of depression. Sammy would have been the last person I would expect because I was sure he knew what was going on in his body. But now I look at it as um, any person battling depression, mental illness, it's not someone I would, I would overlook or I would take chances on. There are like three, three levels when we talk about suicide. One is just the thinking about it because that is the beginning of it all. Then there is the attempts or gestures. Then there are those who actually complete it. Mental health is spoken of so rarely that it will be hard to imagine that people can emerge from those dark places that their minds tell them they are in. But triumph over mental illness is possible and it can be a beautiful thing. very verbal, up and about, into many things. And then when I went abroad in the US, I started becoming more suppressed and not speaking, not sharing things. And at the time, it didn't really affect much on a mental space, but emotionally and psychologically, it took its toll. So what happened later on in life, I had manic depression. and uh, things like um, not having a strong family setting when I was abroad, you know, it was not as strong as a family should be, not able to express myself, not being true, being true in myself, you know, like and saying that I'm not okay or this is wrong or, you know, and just putting a facade. So I went back to revisit my past, you know, and I, I, I started writing things, you know, and um, I started writing and reflecting um, what I'd gone through and whether I'd come to peace with it, you know, because if you don't come to peace with your past, it's always going to bite you, it's always going to find a way to sneak in, in a way you don't like necessarily, okay? So if you take the time to look from that past perspective, you will find where everything emanated from or where it started from. So for me, my family was there throughout, even when I was hospitalized and I came out. The last time I had my um, manic moment was six years ago. And since then, basically what's been very important for me is just being in check of my emotions, uh, my moods, and knowing um, when, let's say, you feel something that's off from the norm, and just being cognizant of that. 
and that's been a very big thing. Uh, being at peace with the past, I've been able to do that, so the root of where it came from has been uh, nicely and probably, I would say, taken care of. And also being able to go back to expressing myself uh, in my ideas, vocally, creatively, through my music, everything. And then also having also some drugs that have a factor of calming the mind. I know she's not in control, but I had to bring it to her to understand that this is no longer something that should be taken lightly. It is something we must fight. When he gave me his concerns, I saw that I have to change, and that is when I decided to accept my condition. It was hard to accept that I was like that and take medications to the latter as per the doctor. Being more self-aware is the one thing I would say has helped me get through things because if I bottled everything up, if I never wrote, I would probably have died a long time ago. I can't say I've completely understood it. I've read about it. I've, I've gone for talks about it. I've met with a variety of psychologists about it. I'm aware of the reality of the situation that I have an imbalance in my mind, in my mental, and but it's still such an abstract concept. I know it's difficult to talk to the people around you, first of all, because you're afraid. You feel you're going to be judged. But I'd like you to think that first, this is your life. It's the most important thing to you than anyone else's thoughts. Your life, you are important. You, your space here is valid. You, you have a role to play with your gifts, with your thoughts, with your ideas. They need to be here to improve the quality of life of other people. If you've seen them when they're good, how you treat them when they're normal, treat them the same way because support is what helps people also feel better and feel like they can actually climb the mountain. I spend a lot of time out chasing career, chasing, you know, the money, chasing, you know, uh, getting, you know, better salary and stuff. I think somewhere along there, I f still feel I missed a step. And I'd advise parents, especially mothers, spend time with, especially teenage youth. Yeah, they need to spend time. Whether you take a career break or whatever, I wish I could have. Even if it have young of Yakindani, Napigana vitamin, Nanani, even if it have young of Yakindani, eh, 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 even if it have young of Yakindani, Napigana vitamin, Nanani, even if it have young of Yakindani, eh, 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 Nani, when I go through a lot, society. Feel free to shed your tears. Speak to someone. During this story, I came face to face with the struggle that my cousin faced. I may never know how deep it was, but I do know now that sometimes all we need is a shoulder to lean on. People who understand that it's okay to not be okay. Of all the things that I get emotional about when talking, I get most emotional about you. About me? Mm -hmm. Why? <laughs> because I know how. I know how hard you try. Don't worry. We're in it together, you know that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah but it shouldn't be so hard, you know, like for you. No. Stop worrying about things you don't even know. How do you know it's that bad for me? 
Because I know myself. <laughs> I'm not exactly the easiest person to deal with. Okay. But uh, I'm trying to figure out how to try. <laughs> yeah. And that's all about it. You just start slowly. You try. You fail. You try. You get. You try. You try. You, you know. And you're, you're trying. You've really done well. Even you've done well. The last couple of months, you've really done well. <laughs> Stop disappearing. Yeah, you stopped disappearing. <laughs> I don't know what I would do without you. <laughs> I'm right here. Right here. Right here. Okay. Always will be. I know. Yeah, you have a big head in your, your, your good times. Yeah. So, Even if you stress me. I'm still here. You have no choice. You're my mother. You love me. <laughs> and I'm like a cool person. <laughs> yeah, you are a cool person. Yeah, yeah I, I know. I know, you know.